Welcome to video number two for this week. This one is on sectional conflict and the election of 1860. This lecture is going to get us almost to the Civil War. And we're going to start first with sectional conflict. And most of this is about the, the 1850s, but to understand what's going on in the 1850s, we have to kind of go back and forth a little bit. First of all, let's look at 1846 with something called the Wilmot Proviso. After the Mexican-American War, they have to decide, the United States, I mean, has to decide what to do with all this land that's been taken. Because we get California, Arizona, New Mexico, pretty much the entire American Southwest. And David Wilmot is going to <clears throat> propose that all of the territory gained from Mexico will remain slave free. And there are some people that really, really dislike this idea. Pretty much the Southern senators realize that if this happens, then that balance that's been very delicately preserved between free state and slave state will be forever changed. So the Southern Democrats and the Whigs, who are pro-slavery, are going to fall on one side of this, while the anti-Democrat or anti-slavery Democrats and the anti-slavery Whigs fall on the other side of this. The Wilmot Proviso is going to pass the House, but it's never going to pass the Senate. And that's simply because the House of Representatives is based on population. The North had a larger population, but when it comes to the Senate, that's even 50-50. So the failure of the Wilmot Proviso is going to bring on this idea of popular sovereignty. And in popular sovereignty, it's going to be championed by a guy named Stephen Douglas. And the big idea is to let the new territories decide whether they're going to be free or slave. So the people who live in each state, or not state, but territory, are going to vote, do you want slaves or do you want to be free? And that's supposed to be a solve it all. In reality, it's going to make things much, much worse. And the reasons for that, uh, abolition is becoming even more radical than it already was. Uh, we've got new political parties, specifically the Free Soil Party. Uh, the Free Soil Party, it's made up by anti-slavery Whigs and anti-slavery Democrats. And it's just that, no slavery, no slave, uh, free soil. And <clears throat> the idea of manifest destiny, it, it starts to fade into the background and everybody is talking about slavery. Uh, all the debates over education, all the debates over women's suffrage and reforms, all of that goes into the background and slavery is the only topic that they care about. Well, in the election of 1848, that's the first time that we get the Free Soil Party running in the election. So we get the Whigs nominating Zachary Taylor, who is a slaveholder from Louisiana, but he's also a slave owner. We have the Democrats nominating Lewis Cass, who is pro-popular sovereignty. And then we have Martin Van Buren, the former president, who is completely anti-slavery. And as you can see here from the picture, uh, Zachary Taylor wins by a pretty large margin, 163 to 127. Martin Van Buren's Free Soil Party doesn't do well per se, but it does start a conversation. We have a problem with California. Uh, I know California just became a state in, or a territory basically in 1848, with the introduction of the gold rush. By 1850, though, it already has enough people in it to become a state. So California is going to apply for statehood, and they want to be an anti-slave state. And that's not necessarily because they are anti-slave. It's more of that they're just anti-everyone. They don't want a bunch of people coming in and taking their gold claim. 
Plus, if California enters as a free state, uh, it's going to permanently upset that balance of slave versus not slave, which at the time was 1515. Henry Clay. This is the same Henry Clay from the 1820s who invented the, the Missouri Compromise. This is the same Henry Clay that worked with John Quincy Adams and James Madison. This is the same Henry Clay that ran for president in 1828. In 1850, he writes a new compromise. And in this compromise, he is going to <clears throat> suggest that California be admitted as a free state, that we settle the boundary between Texas and Mexico, and then we create the new territory of New Mexico, and then we let New Mexico decide using popular sovereignty whether it's going to be slave or not. <clears throat> Another part of this is that we're going to strengthen the Fugitive Slave Act. And more than anything else, the Fugitive Slave Act is going to expand the slavery. Because for the first time, slave hunters, as I'm going to call them, can go anywhere in the country, find somebody who is supposedly a runaway slave, and then return them. Now that means that the people who they go and they find, they may or may not be a slave. If you've seen the movie 12 Years a Slave, you get an idea of what, what we're talking about. You could be a slave and have actually run away, or you could just be an African-American and you can fill a quota. <clears throat> so this Future Slave Act really, really, really expands the scope of slavery, and there are a lot of people unhappy about that. And in reality, <clears throat> this compromise is supposed to keep the balance, it's supposed to please Mexico, um, it's supposed to let the new territory choose their own adventure, so to speak, and it just, it doesn't work. Nobody is happy with the compromise. This is going to move on to an event called Bleeding Kansas. The Kansas and Nebraska territories, they were originally what's considered unorganized. But by the late 1840s, there are enough settlers in both of these places that it can be organized into two different ter territories, one called the Kansas Territory and the other called the Nebraska Territory. <clears throat> because both of these territories are further north than the Missouri Compromise Line, which was the lower border of Missouri, they're both supposed to be close to slavery. But Southern and government officials, they want Kansas and Nebraska open to slavery because they've lost everywhere else. So Stephen Douglas is going to propose that residents of the slavery of the territories be allowed to vote on the issue of slavery. So the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, it splits the two territories and then it provides popular sovereignty in both of them. And the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 basically repeals and undoes the entire Missouri Compromise of 1820. So suddenly, we have these pro-slavery and these anti-slavery groups moving into Kansas ready for a fight. They're all trying to get there to establish residency in Kansas before the referendum, before the vote. And the government of Kansas is going to incorporate the Missouri Slave Code before any elections even happen. And these slave codes are going to contain severe penalties against anyone who spoke against slavery, anybody who wrote against slavery, and anybody who assisted a fugitive slave would be put to death. So these laws are passed in Kansas and nobody's happy. <clears throat> the anti-slave people are completely outraged and they set up their own anti-slavery legislature in the city of Topeka. So suddenly there are two governments in Kansas, each outlawing the other, and the president, Franklin Pierce, 
only recognized the, the pro-slavery legislature. Because of this tension, as I said, violence breaks out. People are tarred and feathered, people are kidnapped, people are killed. And on May 21st, 1856, a group of pro-slavery men are going to enter Lawrence, Kansas, where they burn the Free State Hotel, they destroy two printing presses, and they destroy homes as well. In retaliation for that, an abolitionist named John Brown is going to lead a group of men on an attack at Potawatomi Creek. And this group, which included four of Brown's own sons, will drag five pro-slavery men from their homes and, and half them to death. Violence even erupts in Congress itself. The abolitionist Senator Charles Sumner, he's going to, do, to give a speech called The Crime Against Kansas. And I have a link to it here for you if you're interested. It's a 106 page long speech that took him two days to deliver. And he accuses pro-slavery senators of, quote, cavorting with the harlot labor. Now, in retaliation for this, a congressman from South Carolina named Preston Brooks attacks Charles Sumner at his Senate desk and beats him unconscious with a tank. Now, eventually, in September of 1856, there's a new territorial governor named John Geary who is going to be appointed and restore order. And by the time order is restored, about 55 to 60 people are killed given the violence. So Kansas has to draft a constitution, and the pro-slavery Lecompton Constitution is written in September of 1857 and then ratified in December of 1857. Uh, when people are voting for it, they're only given two choices. They're given the choice between limited amounts of slavery or unlimited amounts of slavery. There is no way to vote no slavery. And because of that, those who believe in abolition refuse to cast their ballot. So the president in 1857 was James Buchanan. James Buchanan is gonna urge Congress to admit Kansas as a slave state, but Stephen Douglas and his followers uh, refused to let this happen because an actual election with no slavery as a choice does not happen. In August of 1858, another vote is taken where the Lecompton Constitution is rejected. And then there is a state convention in July of 1859 that adopted a free state constitution. Kansas is going to apply for admittance into the Union in 1859 as a free state, but the pro-slavery senators stop it. It's not until 1861 that Kansas gets allowed or admitted into the Union, and that's only because the Confederate states have seceded the United States. So the election of 1860, what happens here? Um, the election of 1860 it really starts in 1856. You've got a coalition of the Free Soil Party and abolitionists who oppose the Kansas and Nebraska Act that are going to form a brand new party known as the Republican Party. Along with the Free Soilers and the abolitionists, you have members from the Dying Know Nothing Party who oppose slavery and immigration joining with the Republicans. The Republicans are going to nominate John C. Fremont, who is the, the Oregon Trail guide and the one who, who uh, surveyed the California Trail. James Buchanan will become president. He will win the election. And the sitting president, Miller Fillmore, he runs for re-election as a Whig, and he loses very, very badly. 174 electoral college votes for James Buchanan, 114 for uh, John C. Fremont, and then Miller Filmer only gets eight electoral college votes. It's really an embarrassing loss for the sitting president. Now, Buchanan's presidency is going to make things worse, and that's primarily because he tries to ignore and pretend the issue of slavery doesn't exist. But when the Dred Scott case makes it to the Supreme Court, he's forced to 
A little backstory on Dred Scott. He was born a slave in 1799. In 1830, his owners moved to St. Louis, Missouri, and they sell Dred Scott to a new owner who is a military surgeon named John Emerson. John Emerson and Dred Scott, they do their business in the non-slavery territories of Illinois and Wisconsin. And when John Emerson dies, he dies in, I believe it's Wisconsin, and Dred Scott says, I'm a free man now because my master died while I was in a non-slave territory. Well, John Emerson's wife is going to sue her, is going to try to sell Dred Scott, and Dred Scott's going to sue Mrs. Emerson for his freedom. He says that since the Emerson's moved around so much and, and Dred Scott was taken outside of Missouri and lived in an area that was free, then that meant that Dred Scott was free once his master died. The St. Louis courts are going to rule in favor of Mrs. Emerson. Dred Scott and his lawyers appeal it all the way to the Supreme Court. And at that point, James Buchanan has to come out and give an opinion. And James Buchanan is going to say, uh, you have to consider the broader question here whether slavery is legal or not. When the decision is handed down in 1857, it's going to be said that um, no African American, whether slave or free, could ever be considered citizens since the founding fathers could not have intended such a result. So the Supreme Court, it affirms slavery is legal and it fully protects slave owners if they choose to bring their slave to Western territories, Northern territories, you name it. The Supreme Court in 1857 confirms slavery is legal and cannot be stopped. In response to this, abolitionists, they become even more radical and they become violent. And one of these abolitionists is John Brown, the exact same John Brown from the Bleeding Kansas I talked about a minute ago. And he leads a raid on a federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. His idea is to seize weapons and arm slaves for rebellion. And uh, John Brown, he's got 21 men with him. The state of Virginia finds out that it is happening and the military is sent in. And when the military is sent in, John Brown and uh, the survivors of the rebellion are trapped and captured, they're tried, and they're hanged. And this just brings the South even more close to civil war than they already were. Now, a big question is, where does Lincoln fit in all of this? Um, Abraham Lincoln, you know, he was born in Kentucky in 1809. He moved to Indiana as a small child, and eventually he moves to Illinois in the year 1830. He settles down in Springfield, Illinois, where he becomes a riverboat captain, and he runs for office in Illinois as a Whig in 1832, but he loses. Uh, finally, in 1834, he wins an election, and he's going to serve from 1834 to 1842 as a state, Illinois, state of Illinois representative. In 1858, Abraham Lincoln is going to run for Senate, and he and Stephen Douglas are going to give a very famous set of debates throughout Illinois, one for each of their congressional districts. And Stephen Douglas is going to defend popular sovereignty. Lincoln is going to argue that the, the United States cannot survive half slave and half free. And these Two debates are very heavily covered throughout the state and the country. Now, Lincoln, by the way, he sees slavery as immoral personally, but he does not in any way believe in racial equality. Also, Lincoln's day job is a constitutional lawyer, so he, he also recognizes that slavery can't just be changed. A constitutional amendment must be passed. Ultimately, Abraham Lincoln is going to lose the election Stephen Douglas will retain his Senate seat, but Lincoln is going to become a household name. 
1860, what actually happens? We have four candidates for president. We've got Abraham Lincoln, who is a member of the Free Soil Party. He's not yet a Republican. He argues that slavery is immoral, but it is constitutional. And he has no problem with relocating Native Americans uh, who resist. And then ultimately, he will be adopted and also nominated by the Republican Party. Stephen Douglas is a Northern Democrat. The Democratic Party, they have their convention in Baltimore, Maryland in 1860. And the Southern Democrats don't like the choice of Stephen Douglas because Stephen Douglas does not specifically support slavery. He's okay with popular sovereignty. He's okay with the people choosing, but he does not guarantee slavery. So when the Southern Democrats walk out, they have their own convention in the name John Breckinridge, who was the sitting vice president. And John Breckinridge was a Southerner. He was an extreme supporter of Southern rights, and he was a very, very strong supporter of slavery. Then we have John Bell, who's a member of the Constitutional Union Party. And John Bell's whole platform was just keeping the, the Union together. The ultimate result, Abraham Lincoln wins. 180 electoral college votes, second place gets 72. And you see here from the, the image, Stephen A. Douglas, he gets the second most votes, but he only gets 12 electoral college votes. And that is because Stephen Douglas came in second place in just about every state. He may not have won, but he was second place. But Lincoln wins. After the election is over, the Southern states start to talk about leaving the Union, and a Kentucky senator named John Crittenden, he attempts what becomes known as the Crittenden Compromise. He wants to restore the Missouri line, and he wants to extend the Missouri line all the way to the, the uh, Pacific Ocean. Any state above the Missouri line will be uh, slave-free, and any state below the Missouri line will be full of slaves. Now, it's really hard to go back in time, but the Southern congressmen were willing to try. It's actually the Northern congressmen that say no because they think they have slavery on the run and that they can defeat slavery. South Carolina is going to secede from the Union on December 20th, 1860, and that is significant because Abraham Lincoln won't even become president until March 4th of 1861. James Buchanan is president when South Carolina leaves the Union. Abraham Lincoln begs James Buchanan to do something, and James Buchanan basically says, it's not my problem anymore, it's yours. So Abraham Lincoln is eventually going to say that he doesn't want to fight the South, that as long as the South doesn't do anything, then the North won't either. But unfortunately, in April of 1861, uh, the South Carolina militia is going to attack Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor, and Lincoln has no choice but to declare that South Carolina is an open rebellion. Very quickly, votes in the South are taken on whether to leave the Union or not. And by February 1st, 1861, this is once again before Lincoln is even president, South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas all have left the Union and they begin to form their own government. Uh, the Confederate government, it takes eight days to form. It's based very much on the U.S. Constitution, except it guarantees slavery. It lengthens the presidential term from four years to six years, and it gave the Confederate president the right to the line item veto. Basically, whoever's, in the, whoever's the president of the Confederacy can just cross through parts of laws that they dislike and make them mean something completely different. Former state senator, or I'm sorry, not state senator, but former U.S. Senator Jefferson Davis is going to be elected the president of the Confederacy. Jefferson Davis was from Mississippi. And then Alexander Stevens, a member of the Senate from Georgia, is going to be elected vice president of the confederacy so that is the 
what happened leading up to the Civil War in a nutshell. 